Here are nursing practice questions from 21 to 30. If you haven't subscribed yet, consider supporting my small channel. Thank you. A nurse is caring for an intubated client receiving a continuous sedative infusion. Which interventions by the nurse reflect correct understanding of preventing ventilator-acquired pneumonia? Select all that apply. 1. Elevating the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees. 2. Performing hourly inline endotracheal suctioning. 3. Practicing strict hand hygiene. 4. Providing frequent oral care with chlorhexidine. 5. Scheduling daily sedation vacations. Correct answer. Mechanically ventilated clients are at risk for developing ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, due to sedation and impairment of natural defenses, like coughing by artificial airways. Interventions to reduce the risk of VAP include elevating the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees, like semi-fowler position, option 1. Providing oral care with antiseptic solutions, like chlorhexidine mouthwash and suctioning subglottic secretions, option 4. Performing scheduled daily sedation vacations and maintaining appropriate client sedation levels, option 5. Practicing strict hand hygiene, option 3. Option 2, endotracheal suctioning should be performed only when clinically indicated, like adventitious breath sounds, coughing. Elevated peak airway pressure. Frequent suctioning increases the risk for tracheal and bronchial trauma, bleeding, and hypoxia. Educational objective. Mechanically ventilated clients are at risk for developing ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, due to sedation and use of an artificial airway. VAP prevention includes elevating the head of the bed 30 to 45 degrees, providing regular oral hygiene with chlorhexidine solution, practicing strict hand hygiene, and performing daily sedation vacations. Emergency medical service personnel are transporting a near-drowning victim who is currently hypothermic. Based on anticipated vital signs, the nurse needs to prepare for which interventions? Select all that apply. 1. Covering client with warm blankets. 2. Log rolling the client from side to side frequently. 3. Mechanical ventilation. 4. Warmed blood administration. 5. Warmed IV fluids. Correct answer. The initial management of a near drowning victim focuses on airway management due to potential aspiration, leading to acute respiratory distress syndrome, pulmonary edema, or bronchospasm, leading to airway obstruction. Hypoxia is managed and prevented by ensuring a patent airway via intubation and mechanical ventilation as necessary. Option 3. Careful handling of the hypothermic client is important because as the core temperature decreases, the cold myocardium becomes extremely irritable. Frequent turning could cause spontaneous ventricular fibrillation and should not be performed during the acute stage of hypothermia. Continuous cardiac monitoring should be initiated, option 2. There are passive, active external, and active internal rewarming methods. Passive rewarming methods include removing the client's wet clothing, providing dry clothing, and applying warm blankets. Active external rewarming involves using heating devices or a warm water immersion. Active internal rewarming is used for moderate to severe hypothermia and involves administering warmed IV fluids and warm humidified oxygen, options 1 and 5. Option 4, unless blood loss has occurred from trauma during the near-drowning incident, administration of blood products is not indicated. Educational Objective Emergency department care of near-drowning victims includes advanced airway management, aggressive oxygenation, establishing IV access and administering IV fluids, warmed if hypothermic, and monitoring for cardiac arrhythmias and fluid imbalances. The nurse is caring for a client in the immediate postoperative period following an exploratory laparotomy after sustaining a gunshot wound to the abdomen. Which assessment finding is most important for the nurse to report to the healthcare provider? 1. 
Cold and clammy skin. 2. Oxygen saturation of 92%. 3. Sinus tachycardia of 108 per minute. 4. Urine output of 0.6 milliliters per kilogram per hour. Correct answer. Hypovolemic, hemorrhagic, shock may occur after abdominal trauma or surgery as mesenteric edema resolves and previously compressed sites of bleeding reopen. The shock continuum is staged in severity from initial, I, to irreversible, IV. During the initial stage, there is inadequate oxygen to supply the demand at the cellular level and anaerobic metabolism develops. At this point, there may be no recognizable signs or symptoms. As shock progresses to the compensatory stage, sympathetic compensatory mechanisms are activated to maintain homeostasis, like oxygenation, cardiac output. Cold, clammy skin indicates failing compensatory mechanisms, like progressive stage, an immediate intervention is necessary to prevent irreversible shock and death, option 1. Option 2, slightly low oxygen saturation may occur when there is inadequate oxygen supply and increased metabolic demand. It is not the most important finding to report. Option 3, sinus tachycardia is part of the compensatory response to maintain cardiac output and oxygen demand. It is not the most important finding to report. Option 4, as shock continues. The kidneys decrease filtration and increase reabsorption to maintain blood pressure, eventually resulting in decreased urinary output. Normal urine output is 0.5 to 1 milliliter per kilogram per hour or greater than 30 milliliters per hour. Educational objective. Cold, clammy skin in a client with shock indicates that compensatory mechanisms are failing and that hypoperfusion is occurring. This should be reported promptly to the healthcare provider as immediate intervention is necessary to prevent irreversible shock. The student nurse observes the respiratory therapist, RT, preparing to draw an arterial blood gas from the radial artery. The RT performs the Allen's test and the student asks why this test performed before the blood sample is drawn. Which statement made by the RT is most accurate? 1. The Allen's test is done to determine if capillary refill is adequate. 2. The Allen's test is done to determine if the radial pulse is palpable. 3. The Allen's test is done to determine the patency of the ulnar artery. 4. The Allen's test is done to determine the presence of a neurologic deficit. Correct answer. The radial artery site at the wrist is preferred for collecting an arterial blood gas sample because it is near the surface, is easy to palpate and stabilize, and has good collateral supply from the ulnar artery. The patency of the ulnar artery can be confirmed with a positive modified Allen's test. The modified Allen's test includes the following steps. Instruct the client to make a tight fist, if possible. Occlude the radial and ulnar arteries using firm pressure. Instruct the client to open the fist. The palm will be white if both arteries are sufficiently occluded. Release the pressure on the ulnar artery. The palm should turn pink within 15 seconds as circulation is restored to the hand. Indicating patency of the ulnar artery, positive Allen's test. If the Allen's test is positive, the arterial blood gas can be drawn. If negative and the palm does not return to a pink color. An alternate site, e.g., brachial artery, femoral artery, must be used. Option 1. Capillary refill is tested by applying pressure to the fingernail bed to cause blanching. If refill is adequate, the nail bed should become pink in less than 3 seconds after pressure is released. Option 2. The radial artery is palpated with the fingertips to determine the presence of the radial pulse. Option 4. A neurologic deficit is assessed by monitoring color, sensation, and movement of the hand. Educational objective. The radial artery site at the wrist is preferred for collecting an arterial blood gas sample because it is near the surface, easy to palpate and stabilize, and has good collateral supply from the ulnar artery.
The patency of the ulnar artery must be confirmed by performing a modified Allen's test to assure adequate circulation to the hand before proceeding with the arterial blood gas collection. A client with hypothermia has just arrived in the emergency department via ambulance. The client is being rewarmed with blankets, and the IV fluids are being changed over to warmed fluids. What additional intervention is a priority? 1. Attaching the cardiac monitor. 2. Covering the client's head. 3. Drawing blood for electrolytes and glucose. 4. Placing an additional large bore IV catheter. Correct answer. Hypothermia occurs when the core temperature is below 95 F, 35 C, and the body is unable to compensate for heat loss. As the core temperature decreases, the cold myocardium becomes extremely irritable and prone to dysrhythmias. The client should be handled gently as spontaneous ventricular fibrillation could develop when moved or touched. Therefore, placing the client on a cardiac monitor is a high priority. The nurse should anticipate defibrillation in these clients. Option 2, covering the client's head is indicated to prevent heat loss. However, this can be done after the cardiac monitor has been attached. Depending on the severity of the hypothermia, the trunk should be warmed before the extremities to reduce the risk of after drop, core temperature drops further. This is due to cold peripheral blood returning to the central circulation. Option 3, a blood draw for laboratory testing is important but should be performed after the cardiac monitor is attached. Option 4, two large bore eye catheters are preferred. This can be accomplished after the cardiac monitor has been attached. Educational objective, cardiac monitoring and gentle handling of the client are a high priority with hypothermia. The cold myocardium is extremely irritable and prone to dysrhythmias. The nurse should anticipate defibrillation in these clients. The student nurse and the registered nurse are caring for a mechanically ventilated client with an acute lung injury. Which statement by the student nurse indicates a need for further education? 1. I will auscultate the neck to assess for endotracheal cuff leaks. 2. I will perform endotracheal suctioning routinely after oral care. 3. I will provide oral care and oral suctioning every two hours. 4. I will reposition the client from side to side at least every two hours. Correct answer. Endotracheal, ET. Suctioning improves ventilation in mechanically ventilated clients by removing mucus and secretions from the ET tube. Suctioning is performed based on clinical findings such as adventitious breath sounds, elevated peak airway pressure, coughing, or signs of acute respiratory distress. Frequent suctioning increases the risk of tracheal and bronchial trauma, bleeding, and hypoxia. Suctioning should be performed only when needed to reduce the risk for injury, option 2. Option 1, auscultating the neck to monitor for an ET tube cuff leak is a standard component of respiratory assessment in mechanically ventilated clients. The presence of a cuff leak increases the risk of accidental extubation, impairs ventilation, and allows aspiration of secretions from the mouth and throat. Option 3, oral care with oral suctioning is performed every two hours to prevent ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP. Secretions in the mouth and throat often contain bacteria that can cause pneumonia. Option 4. Repositioning clients at least every two hours reduces the occurrence of VAP. Turning clients side to side promotes mobilization of secretions and prevents secretions from pooling in dependent areas of the lungs. Educational Objective Endotracheal suctioning in mechanically ventilated clients should be performed based on assessment findings such as adventitious breath sounds, elevated peak airway pressure, coughing, or acute respiratory distress. Suctioning should be performed only when needed to reduce the risk of lung trauma and hypoxia. The flight nurse assesses an alert and oriented client at an industrial accident scene who was impaled in the abdomen by a pair of scissors. 
Which nursing action is the immediate priority on arrival at the scene? 1. Insert a large bore IV line and infuse normal saline. 2. Obtain blood for type and cross match in hemoglobin. 3. Remove constrictive clothing to enhance circulation. 4. Stabilize the scissors with sterile bulky dressings. Correct answer. A sharp object that pierces the skin and lodges in the body may result in penetrating trauma to nearby tissue and organs. Common types of impaled, embedded, objects include bullets or blast fragments from firearms as well as sharp objects such as scissors, nails, or knives. The embedded object creates a puncture wound and then controls potential bleeding by putting pressure on the wound. First responders should not manipulate or remove the impaled object. Manipulation or removal may cause further trauma and bleeding, therefore, stabilization of the object is the first priority to prevent it from moving during initial client assessment, option 4, and later during transport to a healthcare facility where skilled trauma care is available. Exception to the rule, first responders, EMS providers, may remove the impaled object if it obstructs the airway and prevents effective cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Option 1, an IV line may be inserted in fluids begun on scene after stabilization of the object and initial assessment. Option 2, blood may be drawn after stabilization of the object and initial assessment. Option 3, clothing may be removed on scene after stabilization of the object and initial assessment. Educational Objective an impaled object should not be manipulated or removed at the scene as further trauma and bleeding of soft tissue and surrounding organs may occur. The embedded object is stabilized on scene to allow for initial client assessment and later transport to a healthcare facility where skilled trauma care is available. An intoxicated client not wearing a seatbelt drives into a metal barricade near the entrance to the emergency department. The client's head has hit the windshield, and the client is unconscious. What nurse actions are appropriate? Select all that apply. 1. Assess the client for a carotid pulse. 2. Determine the client's Glasgow Coma Scale score. 3. Maintain airway with head tilt, chin lift maneuver. 4. Place a hard cervical collar on the client. 5. Remove the client from the car onto a backboard. Correct answer. The transference of kinetic energy to the client's body from an opposing force during sudden deceleration, like fall, motor vehicle collision, causes bodily injury. If the client is not wearing a seatbelt during an automobile crash, the client may strike, or be propelled through, the windshield, causing blunt force trauma to the head, neck, or spine. The unconscious client should first be assessed for adequate breathing and the presence of a pulse, using the rule of airway, breathing, and circulation, ABCs, option 1. Using a rigid cervical collar, cervical spine immobilization must be maintained throughout the client assessment to minimize further injury, option 4. The client should be removed and placed on a backboard after the cervical spine has been stabilized, option 5. The nurse should also perform Glasgow Coma Scale scoring to determine the level of neurological impairment, option 2. Option 3, if a client with possible spinal injuries is not breathing, or if the airway is occluded, the nurse should use the jaw thrust technique. The head tilt, chin lift maneuver may hyperextend the neck, compromising the cervical spine. Educational Objective after sudden deceleration with blunt force head injury, the nurse first checks if the client is breathing and has a pulse, using the rule of airway, breathing, and circulation, ABCs. Spinal injury should be presumed, and the cervical spine should be stabilized, e.g., cervical collar. The jaw thrust maneuver may be used to open the airway. A client with acute respiratory distress syndrome is receiving positive pressure mechanical ventilation with 15 cm H2O, 11 mm Hg, positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP. The nurse should assess for which complication associated with PEEP. 1. 
barotrauma, 2. Decreased oxygen saturation, 3. Hypertension, 4. Oxygen toxicity. Correct answer. Positive end expiratory pressure, PEEP, applies a given pressure at the end of expiration during mechanical ventilation. It counteracts small airway collapse and keeps alveoli open so that they can participate in gas exchange. PEEP is usually kept at 5 cm H2O, 3.7 mm Hg. However, a higher level of PEEP is an effective treatment strategy for acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS a type of progressive respiratory failure that causes damage to the type 2 surfactant-producing pneumocytes that then leads to atelectasis, non-compliant lungs, poor gas exchange, and refractory hypoxemia high levels of PEEP, 10 to 20 cm H, O, 7.4 minus 14.8 mm Hg, can cause over-distension and rupture of the alveoli, resulting in barotrauma to the lung. Air from ruptured alveoli can escape into the pulmonary interstitial space or pleural space, resulting in a pneumothorax and or subcutaneous emphysema. Option 2, PEEP opens up collapsed alveoli and improves gas exchange at a lower fraction of inspired oxygen, FiO2, resulting in increased, not decreased, oxygen saturation. Option 3, hemodynamic effects of PEEP include increased intrathoracic pressure which leads to reduced venous return, decreased preload and cardiac output, and hypotension, not hypertension. Option 4. Keeping the alveoli open between breaths with PEEP improves gas exchange across the alveolar capillary membrane, reduces hypoxemia, and allows for the use of a lower FiO2, which can reduce the risk for oxygen toxicity. Educational Objective High PEEP is commonly used to prevent small airway alveolar collapse in clients with ADS. PEEP helps to reduce oxygen toxicity. However, high levels of PEEP, 10-20 cm H2O, 7.4-14.8 mm Hg, can cause barotrauma to the lung, resulting in a pneumothorax, and decreased venous return causes hypotension. The nurse is caring for a client receiving mechanical ventilation. The ventilator begins alarming and displays an alert about low tidal volumes. The nurse checks the endotracheal tube and ventilator tubing but does not find any obvious cause of the alarm. The client's oxygen saturation is decreasing. What should the nurse do next? 1. Call the respiratory therapist to the bedside to troubleshoot the ventilator. 2. Elevate the head of the bed and apply a non-rebreather mask. 3. Increase the oxygen delivery setting on the ventilator to 100%. 4. Manually ventilate with a bag valve mask resuscitator attached to the endotracheal tube. Correct answer. A low tidal volume alarm indicates that the volume of air being delivering by the ventilator is lower than the set volume. This is often due to a disconnection, loose connection, or leak in the ventilator circuit, like tubing. Other causes include changes in the client's breathing efforts or leaking of air around the cuff of the endotracheal tube, ETT. The nurse should first troubleshoot common causes of the alarm, but if the client is showing signs of inadequate oxygenation, the ventilator should be disconnected to allow manual ventilation with a bag valve mask, BVM, resuscitator connected to high flow oxygen, 15 L per minute, option 4. Option 1, respiratory therapists collaborate with nurses and have specialized training in mechanical ventilators. They should be called to the bedside, but the nurse should first begin stabilizing the client. Option 2, the inflated cuff of the ETT creates a seal against the walls of the trachea that ensures air movement is controlled through the tube, instead of passing around the tube. The inflated cuff also prevents aspiration of secretions or gastric contents into the lungs. A non-rebreather mask is ineffective in this case because air delivered through the nares and oropharynx cannot pass around the ETT cuff to reach the lungs. Option 3, the client would benefit from a higher oxygen concentration. However, 
Changing this setting on the ventilator does not guarantee increased oxygen delivery to the client when the set volume of air is not being delivered. The client must be manually ventilated with a BVM resuscitator connected to supplemental oxygen. Educational Objective Ventilators will alarm when set parameters are not being met, like Low tidal volumes These alarms may indicate a change in client condition or ventilator malfunction. The nurse should manually ventilate the client with a bag valve mask resuscitator if an alarm cannot be quickly resolved and the client shows signs of respiratory distress. Tune in for the next video. 31 to 40 nursing practice questions. Like, comment, and subscribe.